Morning, Mr. Wildebeest. And morning, planet Earth. Welcome to Juma Game Reserve this morning. Welcome to Wild Earth Safari. My name is Mark with Becky on camera with me this morning. Tara is back in final control. Hope you're going to enjoy the morning with us. Beautiful Sunday morning. A little bit of cloud in the east. Otherwise, clear skies. Not really much wind yet. Hoping the wind doesn't pick up again as it did yesterday. Got to be rather a miserable day towards the end of the day. Our lonely, sorrowful wildebeest who's lost all his ladies and his babies wanders up and down the open area waiting for them to come back. I can still see you. Hiding behind a tree. Behind him in the distance you can see the mist over the valley of Gauri Dam. Quite a thick mist hanging down there. Well, let's see what we can find for you today. Wrap up a little bit tighter. A lot of buffalo tracks behind us and it's actually here they are. Not often we get to see some buffalo out here. Buffalo big bulls. Morning boys. Four of them. Two couples. I didn't see the other two lying down. <coughs> Morning stations, four Dugger boys on quarantine. Tommy, thanks, Tex. You'd think is a reptile moving so slowly in this cold weather. Other bulls looking quite frisky.
<gasps> oh, that hurt. He looks to be like the kind of bull you don't want to meet on foot. The other bulls may be a little bit less intimidating, perhaps. He looks like he's looking for a fight. Got a bit of a growth on his chin or throat. A bit of an abscess there. Let's continue. Let's go down Weaver's Nest and see what's maybe crossed through the middle part of the property. Question from Toronto. Very nice question, actually. One that I should have preempted. <coughs> Jennifer asking about the wildebeest that we saw at the start. Why doesn't he follow his ladies? Relax, old boy. Unfortunately, he's driven by the territorial imperative. He is a territorial bull. He has established his territory here, and that is just the way wildebeest work. That he sets up a territory good grazing, good open area, close to water, access to water. And if he's a really strong and healthy wildebeest, he finds a really good territory. And that automatically should attract some sort of high-end females, which it has done in the past. It's just the last few times that the females have been around, it just so happens that they've also been lion. And so they don't take kindly to lion hanging around, even if the lion are only here for a night. So they had moved on somewhere else. They were here for breeding. They're now pregnant, so there wouldn't be any breeding now anyway. One would think that that would be the simple answer to just follow his females and unfortunately his hormones and his instinct and his makeup, I don't mean his L'Oreal makeup, I mean his genetic makeup, precludes him from following his females. Aha! A leopard track of a young one. Only one track. Can't be, gotta be more. Thank you, JJ, Janet. Lions were calling around 4 30 this morning, but my question then, Miss Jones, Miss, Miss, Mrs. Janet, my question is then. How close was it? How loud was it?
Well, there's one solution to Janet's comment about lion calling. Evidently, two male lions crossed over from Simbambili would have crossed over Triple M somewhere. Perhaps we ought to be doing Vertilla Access Road. But what we'll do is we'll do Filament's cut line <coughs> up to Impala Plains and further north see where those, if those lion came across there. Leopard tracks could have been a little bit old. Thank you Janet. Civet tracks. Janet saying not very close, the lion. It might have been the same lion then coming across Triple M from Simbambili. Stacy in Australia. I think I got most of that. Stacy was saying she was watching a documentary on leopard. Where a leopard adopted, well, not adopted, but caught a young baboon. I don't even see a ground hornbill in a tree, but we'll probably see it from. I can actually hear it now. I was looking at something beige, which turns out to be the tree trunk of a marula tree that's broken off in the distance. And just happened to see to the left of it, I now see it with my eyes, is the ground hornbill sitting in a tree far away. Hmm? Too far. It is a bit too far. We might see that when we get onto filaments cut line. But Stacy was asking, have you ever known of anything similar of a prey animal adopting a prey species? Well, I don't know if it's so much as adopting as much as it, I don't know. It's hard to explain the motivation behind it. There was a famous case in Kenya of a lioness that kept adopting young antelope. Young, I don't know whether they were eland, I think they were eland, young, very small bay antelope, so it was probably eland. But she kept losing them because either she couldn't feed them and they would die or the big male would eat them. So I think there were five that she adopted. And the, well, I wouldn't really use the word adopted. But attempted to perhaps, I don't know what word to use honest. It's unusual behaviour. It's the only other case I know of. I mean there are many cases of domestic animals adopting and that's where you can use the word adopting because they're suckling. When I was in the Navy we had a we had a camp dog, well ship's dog, an Alsatian, a German Shepherd called Shelley. She was a gorgeous dog, she belonged to one of the officers, or actually one of the midshipmen, he wasn't an officer yet. And I was, I inherited two kittens that became the ship's cats. But they were very small when I inherited them, and well I didn't inherit them, but they were orphaned and I had no choice but to take them in. And Shelley used to sit outside my door every morning to come in 
so that she could lie and let the kitten suckle. Although she wasn't producing milk, she just loved that, that attention she would get from these two kittens. Somewhere in my box of photos, I've got photos of this German Shepherd. <laughs> two little, a little grey and a little black kitten. Grey and white and black and white. And there are many stories in, of, of animals adopting others. Look at that ground hornbill in the tree there. I'm sure they might be nesting today. I've seen them here a couple of times. You can hear one closer to us on this left hand side of the road that's answering that one. When you keep quiet, you might be able to hear them. They were calling when it was still dark this morning, so I wonder if they weren't maybe split up before it got dark last night, and they've been calling all night. Just to keep in touch. Ah, I see it now. It's behind the tree, but I just saw movement through this tree. There's a marula tree. Look closer to our left. There's another one. Let's see if we can see this other one. There it is. There's two on the left here. Two. Yeah, well, I can hear two, I can only see one. The other one was in the open. Unless we have rival pairs here. I'm talking to Tara about this. Sometimes we see two, sometimes we see three. And then Tara was telling me she saw five one day. Okay, so those male lions have already crossed through the property. I wonder where. The Texans got their tracks on Twin Dan's Road already, and I haven't found their tracks yet. Crossing either Quarantine or Philemon's Dip. Which means that they've probably gone already. Wow, that means they've traveled quite a distance without stopping. Okay, let's move on. We don't need to do Zoe's road if there's lion already that far south. Maybe we'll see their tracks now cutting through past Treehouse Dam on Bum Road. Well, here's a nicer view of this ground. Goshawk just flowed me. Yeah. 
food there in the water on the tail. Could be a gabog or so. Uh, just behind. Let me see if we can move. Back. Uh, oh, and it's gone. Before we can get an ID. Well, southern ground hornbills. Probably one of the most endangered species we will be likely to see. There's the third one. The third one just flew. Hornbill, I mean. And this one is now flying. And on towards Twin da Treehouse Dam. Here comes the third one now, coming across our bows. Massive birds. How long are the what going on? Oh. Pete's Pond crew, Janie and the Pondies. Sounds like a band. Janie and the Pondies. How long have the safari drives been going on? We've been doing this for about four years and a bit now. Although the cameras have been here for 12 or so. Drag marks. Hyena drag marks. Going the other way though. That's probably going towards the den. I wonder if this hyena stole this kill maybe. We're on Spum Road. I'm going Spum Road because the drag marks come down this way from the south. The drag marks on Spum Road, but it's in PC. Maybe it's haunted something. Kudu up ahead, young bull. boys Youngsters. morning could you <coughs> evidently there was discussion on the chat about carrying a rifle um I can't remember who that was from, but question about not carrying a weapon, what would we do if we're in a dangerous situation, or what would we do if, it's impossible to say, it's not like you can 
every, it's not like every situation is the same to be able to say oh well if an elephant charges I'll do this or if this happens I'll do that it's, it's, it's only it's something that comes with experience having been in that situation and knowing how to deal with that situation at the time um, and being able to react instantly to a situation that you cannot predict could have happened Eating on the thorn tree, regardless of the thorns. You'll find that animals will mostly eat the trees that have thorns and spines, and that's why they have thorns and spines, is because they're the tastiest of all the, the leaves, the most nutritious perhaps, the most palatable. And it's a physical defense that they have because they've had animals browsing on them for a few million years. And it's a physical adaptation to, as a defense mechanism. There's three of them here now. They're all the same age, almost. And there's one that's younger, about a two-year-old. These are about three, three-year-old that we're looking at now. There's one that's just moved through a gap in the bush. He's a little bit younger than these two. <coughs> Let's move on to do our moving into some thicker bush. Later, boys. The direction of the drag marks are still here on the road, although by the looks of things it was late last night, some, or early last night even, that these drag marks were here, but all the way along Spam Road, if you take that drag mark and continue with it, you probably end up at the hyena den, so it must have been taking a carcass back to the den, let the little ones start learning about crunching on bones, but yes, talking about what we would do in a situation that's very difficult to predict. I've been in many situations where even if you had thought of what you would do at the moment something happens everything goes out the window because you have to react to the animal whatever that animal may be and to the circumstances that you're in at the time and it's kind of, I've thought of an, an, an analogy, I've thought of a, a way of maybe making it a bit more understandable the sun finally coming up through cloud and the one thing that I can think of is 
if I had to ask you what you would do if you had a blowout or a car coming straight at you, um, there's so many scenarios, there's so many variations as to what the conditions could be like. Is it day or is it night? Is the road wet or dry? Is it a straight road or a curved road? Is there a lot of traffic or no traffic? what your speed is there's so many variables that you can never say well if I have a blowout on the highway I'll do this but it doesn't work that way it depends on which tire it is it depends there's so many things that you can have in an idea in your head what you think you would do or what you could do and what your best course of action is and it's always good to have that in your head because when pressed and when in that situation you've got to act very very quickly and uh, oh, back to Lear flu from here. Pardon? That could be why these drag marks are here. But that battle just flew and the Franklin took off. As though it was being chased. There is another battle in this tree. So I think there must have been something here. Let's see, can, you, can you see a beautiful light now on that battle Is there two? Where's the second? These could be our bateliers from up on Ledwood Road. It's quite strange that we have drag marks and batelier. So there could have been a kill here yesterday. The battalions were here because it was getting dark and they wanted yeah, to stay. There's another one. Oh, the one's flown. That's the juvenile. That's just flown away. So all three battalions. Two adults, one juvenile. But the drag marks are still here. I need to find where these drag marks come from. But there could very well have been a kill here that was stolen by hyena. But the kill was here during the day yesterday that the battalions have come to and then they of course had to stay here the night hyena came stole the kill they wake up in the morning and there's nothing and they're just waiting for the air to warm up to fly away <coughs> uh, we don't have a nice view i wasn't even looking at the monitor it's just a i can try to go forward a little bit just to get a clearer view of its face Maybe the battalier will move for us. What you eating, bat? It's the most striking of all eagles, actually. What was that? I hope that was just a piece of bark. And I was pecking at something on the branch, but it's way too high for there to have been a kill up there. You can see just behind the head, and the shoulder, behind the shoulders, this particular individual's got a red back. You get some bachelor that have a red back and some that have a white back. Red backed form and the white backed form. It's not a sex thing, it's not governed by sex.
back to back to the beautiful bird. Susie, why is the battalion or not the battalion? The southern ground hornbill, why is it endangered? I don't think that was your word, but that's what you meant. Habitat loss and loss of suitable nesting sites for two of the reasons. There's another adult battalion up there in the jackalberry. Let's have a look quickly at Gary Main. Drag mark is still here from the main road. Just to finish on the subject of sticky situations and what we would do, we just have to, to some extent, rely on our behaviour, make sure that we don't disturb animals to the point that if they're going to get aggressive with us, we can only hope that they don't. Um, they're not that predictable that even though we might behave properly, I don't know, we'll just have to wait and see if that situation arises. Well, well drag mark came from Little Gary. There have been a number of vehicles on this road already, on top of those drag marks. I'm not seeing any tracks from other predators that might give me some indication as to why the Batalier have been hanging around here. Maybe we'll see still, maybe we'll still find out. Just one or two battalia would have been one thing, but all three of them, both adults and the juvenile, or two adults and a juvenile, make me think that there's been something here. Dawn oh, Kudu bulls mostly solitary as they get older. No, not really. They spend a lot of time in bachelor groups. They can be solitary. And especially those younger bulls, they'll hang out together for quite some time.
Hello, Debbie. Oh, there are fresh elephant tracks here in this fresh dung. Oh, just looking at a fresh branch that was in the road. Debbie wants to know when we see when they're a lion, how do we know who they are? Is there a database of pictures of the individuals? But Debbie, pretty much by our area, lion are pretty territorial, so very often we are able to tell who they are just by the area that they're in. Other than that, because they're a social animal, they live in a pride, and the prides are on sort of a fixed group. The composition of the pride, you know, two males, three females, four cubs, will know it's that particular pride because they have two males, three females, excuse me, and four cubs. So that's another way we identify them. But then it gets to be a little bit more complicated when we'll see individuals on their own that are not with the pride on a particular day. And then we have to use things like scars or nicks out of the ear or... The most important thing for lion identification because scars come and go, well, come and come and go, is this, the whisker spot pattern of the individuals. Now, where the three lines of whiskers are just above that, they, they will always be spots above the whisker line, and it's the configuration of those spots that help us identify them. I think cats are the... I think on Facebook there might be something. I'm not sure which... It could be cats of the Sabi sand or... I'm not too sure where Central Database is with all the different lion in the area. some of the ladies on chat will be able to help you. Wow, well, been a lot of elephant here at Treehouse. Back to Philemon's cut line. <laughs> Hello, Yvonne. Gosh, asking my opinion on something. Um, Kevin Richardson, they call the Lion Whisperer. What is my take on that and would I ever do something like that? And I think a lot of people don't realize is that Ke it's one place and they are all hand-reared animals. Uh, Kevin would not be able to do that to Lion here. He, would not, he could not do that to Lion anywhere else other than the Lion that he has helped raise himself. I have to give him a lot of credit for the way he has conducted himself with these cats to have the relationship that he has with them because that can only come from positive reinforcement and far too often in the past people have trained these animals with negative um, feedback 
and for someone to have the kind of relationship that Kevin has with his cats has got to have come from a very very deep understanding and passion for them but it is one little place near Johannesburg where these it's private property where these animals the lion the hyena they were all hand reared so they all see him as part of their group And yeah, I mean, all of us at some point in our lives would love to raise a lion or an animal and be part of a group like, you know, to be able to, to have that kind of interaction. But it's, but I don't think it's something that I would do. Uh, I don't know, hard to say. Oh, here come our kudu bulls that we saw earlier that have come through this way from Shpam Road. Hello, boys. Third one coming up behind us now. Huge front moving across the sky in the east. That wasn't there earlier. And it might come over this way. Okay. You see, I think for me, the, 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 the setback of doing something like that would mean that I would have to be living in a self-contained property with boundaries, no other animals, just the animals that... The, I don't, that would be a little too restrictive for me. I need to live in a place where there are no boundaries. Well, boundaries are very far away. Right here in Kruger, I can go a couple of hundred miles north before I hit a boundary. I can go at least maybe 100 miles, maybe not 100 miles, but close on east before I get to a boundary a couple of hundred miles south before I get to a boundary not too far west but then I hit the western edge of the Sabi sand but just knowing that I'm part of millions of millions and millions of hectares is enough doesn't matter that I can only traverse over this small area of Juma I don't need to traverse a larger area as long as the animals can that freedom that I get from them living with them and them having that kind of freedom and it's the way that I live that just precludes me from being able to have contact with animals physical contact here is a female group of kudu There's some zebra up ahead hello girls and a little, a little one your baby two babies markings on a zebra but it's going into the bushes now everyone's going into the bush there's a little baby pretty not little but a few months old very broad white underneath the tail when they flare their tail like that used for flag signaling when they need to communicate non-verbally with each other either in times of danger or to help follow each other when they're running
still gonna grow into its ear. Takes <sighs> incoming. What happened with that in Golam Corn? Copy, thanks. Oh, wow, those lions crossed the entire area of Juma last night from our western boundary to our eastern boundary. <coughs> That's what Janet must have heard as they walked through. <coughs> They're now in Torchwood. Zebra will move deeper in. Zebra with the kudu. There are more zebra up ahead. Further up ahead. that Texan found the lion guess that he has for asking me to find them lion this morning maybe I can take credit for that when I see them later I'll tell them I was up all night dragging lion across the across the traversing area for them dragging them by their tails to make sure they see them in the morning morning zebra They stop, and if we stop and look at them, they get self conscious. Such a pretty face. Bye right, children, see you later. Stay warm, cold front's about to hit us. That sun that we saw, I think that's the only sun we're gonna see. <coughs> As this front starts to cloud up the sky. Still blue above us. No, how much longer. We're gonna take Zoe's road. I think let's go to the hyena den. See if we can find what See if the thing that was being dragged ended up there. Well, it would have ended up there. If there's any, if there's anything left of it, it's another matter entirely. Lion. It's a different lion. This is not. Uh, it's not lion. It's just giant leopard tracks. I'm 
minute there, I thought it was a sub adult line, and then a clearer track showed me that it's actually, this must be like someone like my, uh, my Fufunyo. Maybe it was him that had a kill on Spum Road, you know what I'm And he lost it. A big bird in a tree up ahead. Hmm. Daddy, You're around here somewhere, killing things and losing them to hyena. Didn't see any tracks on Spum Road. Very distinctive tracks here. Tracks that are much bigger than any of the boys. I should actually measure them if I get to see a nice one. Sleep standing up. I think this is the juvenile battle here. Uh -huh. The one that was on Spum Road. It did fly this way. Do elephants sleep standing up? Yes, they do. But they don't really sleep like we know sleep. None of the animals, the herbivores for that matter, really do sleep. As we know sleep. Just once again, gonna check Gary Main. This leopard went the other way. We'll go up Zoe's road and check. Could have actually just carried on straight across. Hello, little Shimongwe. Don't go. Oh. Zebra tracks here, uh, and giraffe going off to the south. Look at that cloud. Tracks of that big elephant bull who was near Trias Dam, but he doesn't come this way. Zebra, oh Suzanne, sorry Suzanne, Tennessee, why are the zebra here so small, the groups so small compared to the savannah areas, the, I suppose the likes of Serengeti and other large grassland areas, yeah these are the some elephant tracks, oh, I didn't look for leopard, 
but that's because he didn't come this way. He must have crossed straight over, gone on to Triple M. Ryan coming. Ryan coming. Morning. Do you know if anybody has checked uh, Triple M towards Gary Main for tracks this morning? Okay, because I've just lost some tracks of a big male lingue heading west from Filament's cut line. Um, crossed straight over, looks like he would have come out on Triple M close to Gary Main. Yeah, permanent, big mail. The problem with this area is that we don't have the vast open areas. Now in some parts of Kruger there are bigger open grassland areas and there you will find larger groups of zebra. But it is just not prudent for zebra to be living in large groups in this kind of habitat because there'll be so many of them and the and grazing and moving around there'll be so much noise rustling through the grasses and things that they, they'll be easy targets so in this part of the world because of the habitat the type of habitat irrespective of the amount of grasses and grazing that there is it's just not a good idea for zebra to be in large groups why we see them in small pockets, small family groups, a stallion with three, four or maybe even up to eight to ten mares depending on how open it is. Um, civet track, an elephant track. Getting back to the question of sleeping standing up, elephants will lock their knees and their elbows and they will rest for anywhere up to maybe 15-20 minutes in the heat of the day but all of the herbivores don't really sleep none of or rather should I say none of the herbivores really sleep the way we know sleep rhino like rhino and hippo perhaps spend a long time lying down resting but all of the other animals tend to have to be processing their food all the time, either taking food or, or processing it, one of the two, and sleep for them is catching short naps, but if an animal was to sleep the way we know sleep, they'd just be easy targets for predators for one thing, but also they don't have the digestive system that allows them to sleep for, lot, for hours on end. This front's moving fast. Now as we hear on Zoe's road again an idea of how fast it is coming over. A huge wide view of things. Excuse me, Dove. King Alan Hewitt. I'm just going to stop here and again a combination of views of not only that misty valley. I'm wondering if that's maybe not just smoke rather than mist from the campfire that settled in the cold valley. It's hard to tell from here, but that's more or less below Gowry Dam. down in the Milwati. That's that area that had the very, very cold snap. You can see, and it's especially in this kind of a view, that's the, the lowest lying area of the whole place almost. 
and the cold air would have sunk there. And that's why we lost that chameleon and why we've lost so many leaves on the trees in the way we have lost them down there. And it's a very, very cold night one night. King Alan Hewitt wants me to list the animals with retractable claws. Like all the cats, Alan, except the cheetah. Cheetah have protractile claws. They can extend them, but they can't retract them. They're fixed because they pretty much act like the spikes on a runner's shoes. They're fixed to give them grip when they're running at high speed after their prey. And they need to be able to protract and they need to be able to extend their claws when they're reaching out to strike the animal suppose when they're fighting. here at the den but maybe I can find signs of there's been zebra through here. I wonder if they've moved dens again. Pardon? They were here yesterday. There's a lot of hyena activity last night. But lots of tracks here. <coughs> Lots of tracks, I'm sure they're still around. Can't see any sign of the drag marks. From whatever it was that was dragged from Spumrose, or something was brought here. Anyway, I'm go in here and turn around. I think they're probably still out somewhere, a lot of them. There's so much hyena activity last night and there's tracks everywhere. And I suppose there are tracks everywhere every day. If hyenas certainly travel. I saw something pale, but it's actually it's a bulb. It's one of those bulbs that I sometimes pick up after the elephants have dug them up. It looks like the little ones have been chewing on it and playing with it. 
bit all quiet here. Inside, curled up, going to sleep. Maybe some of them out somewhere. Vivian! Looking at the thick mist. Hello Vivian. at the thick mist wondering if it's ideal conditions for predators to hunt well yes it would be it does give them a added measure of secrecy or rather obscurity wow we got an Eskimo Elvis! Elvis Costello! I've seen him for. I've seen him for. I've got him in there. Hey, what did you say? Good morning. Good morning. Hello, how are you? Very good, and you? Good. No, no, there's nothing. They must be sleeping, or some of them are still out. <laughs> yes, they're all curled up in their burrow. <laughs> they haven't the last time. Yes. Either later or earlier. One of the two. Oh, uh, they've got other ones that biffles look. Yes, There was Ingram Corns on Philemon's Cutline, a big male, but he must have gone straight from Philemon's Cutline onto Triple M. I asked Ryan to have a look at Triple M. Otherwise, not much. Yeah, it's amazing. Chris Ryan. I mean, for how many years? 10 years? You're at least guaranteed to be dead with every game drive. Yeah. I haven't seen one that's not chopped. It's amazing. It's incredible. Yeah. Um, Karula was up at Sydney's Dam yesterday. Sydney's Dam, I'm yeah. not allowed that. No, no. But the Mampimpa and the, the, the youngsters were just this side of the gate. You know where the dump is? Yes. Just somewhere near the dump. No, but that's normal. Yeah, <laughs> uh, they're doing quite well. They don't know where one of them is. He might be a Arethusa, but the one boy still hangs around the lodge and the dam, and he, he's doing a lot better. <laughs> yeah. Okay, see you later. Have a lovely day. Yeah, I think the thick mist would help them stay concealed a little bit better. Could do. Right, where shall we go next? Pile of planes and Impala Road, perhaps. Nah. Yes. Nah. Yes. Linda from Ohio, good morning to you. Evening, good morning to Ohio. Are there alligators in the water here? No. There are no alligators in any waters anywhere in Africa. Alligators do not exist on the African continent. Crocodiles, however, 
do. Okay, crocodiles are somewhat different to alligators. I suppose in the same way as a lizard is different to a skink. They belong to the same family, they're just very different animals. Alligators have much broader snouts, don't grow as big as crocodiles, or well, these crocodiles at any rate. But yes, we did have a crocodile here at Tuma Waterhole, or Gowrie Dam. During the summer, it moved on towards the end of summer, early winter. Went back to perhaps more permanent water. And there was also a crocodile, in fact there were two crocodiles at Twin Dams, two different sizes, that kept coming across backwards and forwards from the south, Baboon Pan and beyond. But they too have left the area now, it's going into the dry season, they've probably gone to larger water bodies or even the big crocodile that was here might have even gone back to the river, which is some distance south of us, the Sand River a permanent river. You see, they might know something we don't about what is coming next season, but it might not have anything to do with that. It might just be the fact that it's a dry season. These are seasonal pans and seasonal dams that we have here. There's a strong likelihood that they can dry up and it's easier for a crocodile to go across land to do an overland trip when it's still raining and when it's still there's still a lot of moisture in the air rather than wait until its water dries up and it's exceptionally dry world and it's got to cover long distances <coughs> Maryland in California. Good morning. How long can elephants nurse before they can, how long do they nurse before they can eat? Well the funny thing about elephant, Marilyn, is that they nurse even when they don't need to. You find even a three, four year old elephant still nursing if mom is still lactating. Or lactating again for her next calf at the age of five. Or when that calf is five. Um, I'd say from a few months old they're starting to pick at leaves and things. Um, at least six months there. Starting to feed a little bit on vegetation. I'm not really sure. I mean it depends. Different individuals I think. Some at three months, some at six months. even take a little ride along the triple end. Just to the top of this ridge. B 
been this way for some time now. Getting you, Tara. Might as well just go all the way to Gary Main. We might lose you for a little bit going through this dip. But we might as well go back to Gary Main. If we even still have contact. How are you? Good, yeah, man. Good, thanks. Morning, all. Hi. Heard Ingrid tracks coming from our filaments cut line heading west. Just thought we might find something here. Nothing? No, not yet.
Excuse me, Dove. Sorry. Soldier. I'm just gonna go back to... It's cold. That junction of filament cut line. Zebra. Hello, Zebra. This cloud has not covered the sky. It was blue, and the next minute it's grey. Oh boy! Tempting repairs. Huh. Been doing that all night. Bring in my laptop. I thought I'd bring it along because I'm trying to figure out why it's not starting. Here comes the stallion. Is it a stallion? It's pretty round. Could be a mare. This may be a mare. I'll wait until it comes closer. And he's in front of the quarry bush. This side of the quarry bush, Zebra, please. Thank you. Guys, a bit skittish there. What? That's one of the mares. Uh -huh. Let's move them all off. <coughs> Let's see. I'm gonna have to just take a little stroll. This leopard's lying in the bushes here somewhere. Maybe it'll lift its head if I go walk about. gonna check on things. I think Tara was trying to send me a question but it only got static.
Well, could be anywhere this cat. Once it leaves the road, and we don't find the tracks on another road, that's anyone's guess where he could be. I'm wondering if we should try. No, we've tried already. Let's go down towards Chelapan and Twin Dams and in that area. Yeah. Curious. We were here. Oh wait, there's our tracks. I thought for a minute there were elephant tracks on top of ours. Well, it could be actually. By the way, when we were when I was walking around looking for tracks, now there was, or there were, there were hippo calling from west must be on Arethusa Safari or Arith or Sundambili I wonder the elephant look like they might have just crossed through here so I'm wondering if we shouldn't maybe go back to Zoe's road Debbie was asking about crocodiles or the dams, are they all connected? I think that's what it was. Oh, there's a tiny elephant. No, my tracks are on top of the elephant tracks. Debbie was asking, are the dams all connected? Or, I'm not too sure what the question was. How the crocodiles... They just got over land. They will follow drainage lines where they'll just cross you know, sounds of hippo and frogs and certain birds will help them get direction to other water holes. They'll follow dry riverbeds. They know that they will lead to bigger rivers. But if a crocodile comes here from somewhere else, it knows where it has come from, so it knows where to go back to. I think if that kind of answers the question, I'm not sure if that's what you were meaning, Debbie. The dams that there are here, they're all man, well most of them are all man-made and they're invariably the dam wall is built up across what we call a drainage line, a dry riverbed, a seasonal riverbed. So that in the heavy rains, in the summer months, those riverbeds flow and they fill up the dams. And the crocodiles know that they, they, it's an instinctive thing for them. They know where the rivers are, the dry riverbeds. They know that they lead to bigger rivers. So many fresh elephant tracks here, I'm wondering. I'm really not sure where to go today.
Hello, bits. Bits is asking what would eat the crocodile. <coughs> Only really small crocodiles fall prey to other things, Bet. I mean, from the time they hatch when they're being eaten by anything from monitor lizards to storks, herons, uh, fish eagles, um, hyena, jackal, any of the cats, when they're hatchlings, when they're coming out of the egg, a lot of things will eat them. And in their first few years, when they're still small, you'll get uh, even pythons will eat crocodiles. Um, but once they reach close to adult size from about six to eight foot upwards they become pretty formidable in their own right and this, I've seen footage of a leopard killing a, about a six foot crocodile I've never seen it in real life I've never seen anything eating a crocodile I've never seen anything killing a crocodile other than baby crocodiles being taken by things but once a crocodile gets beyond six to eight feet, there's not very much that can happen to a crocodile. Tara says she's seen pictures of a leopard eating a two and a half meter crocodile. Uh, that was quite a nice shot of those squirrels grooming each other. <laughs> Termite mound, but they stopped. Maybe the third one will be back. Seeing things in threes today. Three ground hornbills, three betelier, now three squirrels, three kudu bulls. Bye-bye, squirrels. I think we'll do Rebecca's Road.
Hello, Donna in Arizona. Question on termites. Termite mounds. Termite mounds abandoned because something else takes over. No, it's actually the other way around. Donna. Termite mounds become occupied by other creatures when the termite colony dies off. And that could have something to do with, well, it could be many things. One of the things that could kill off a colony would be the lowering of the water table and, and them not having access to water anymore. We are only talking about this one species of termite because we don't get to see so many other species. Our buffalo from quarantine, open area, have arrived here today. Hello boys, remember me from this morning? Not very far from where we saw them this morning. Maybe 200 yards, not even across the drainage line, back to the open area. Debbie, yes, termite mounds. They, if something gets into them, like an aardvark, well, maybe, yeah, an aardvark perhaps, and gets to the queen, and they can't then produce enough eggs from a secondary queen to be able to maintain the colony size, to be able to maintain the integrity of the termite mound, the colony can die, can die off. And it's when the colony is dead and they're no longer being able to maintain the structure in a healthy state, it's when other creatures can get into these termite mounds. And Well, you see some of the termite mounds where we see like the squirrels with now or sometimes when we see dwarf mongoose on these termite mounds lots of holes it's not the mongoose that have made those holes those are the tunnels of the termites but there's normally an outer shell that protects those tunnels that keeps the temperature constant that keeps the outside at bay termites have evolved have developed underground they don't have a pigment, they don't have the strong exoskeleton of most insects, they're quite soft bodied, they don't have eyes, they cannot be exposed to the elements for very long. And if something breaks into a termite mound, if they can't fix that hole, so many other things will get in there and to eat them. So the colony will collapse. asking if there's any chance of seeing a giraffe always a good chance of seeing a giraffe today I've seen a few tracks 
but not them yet. I'm gonna go back to Impala Road and go up to Sandy Patch. Maybe giraffe up there. Some days we're in the right place at the right time and some days it's just not happening. It's getting colder now than it was earlier. Eileen <laughs> from Washington State, good morning to you. What's the biggest animal lion or pride of lion can take down? Well, lion are known to have taken down even the matriarch of an elephant group that would have been quite a lot of lion and that would be extenuating circumstances it would be a particular area where lion are starting to take down larger elephant where for many years they were mostly taking down youngsters and now they're starting to go for bigger elephant and able to overwhelm them and subdue them but on a more common note giraffe buffalo very common for lion pride to take down the likes of a giraffe, big male even, adult bull, that's 1200 kilograms worth of giraffe, or big adult buffalo bulls, 800-900 kilograms. Depends on how many male lion there are and how many well how many in the pride too when bringing down giraffe and adult buffalo bulls normally helps to have a male or two of their size and their strength <coughs> but still it's a, an incredible feat I mean we're talking about animals that are only a couple of hundred kilograms in weight bringing down something so big it's like a domestic cat bringing down a goat. Elvis must have come this way. Morning to Kazakhstan, Dr. Alexei in Kazakhstan. How long do elephants live? Well, in the wild, anywhere between 55 and 60, maybe 65 years. Probably more, 55 to 60 years. who that was from oh Stacy in Australia 
Sorry, we're in a really bad radio area. Not only that, but our signal area. On the limits here. Stacy, morning, Australia, Melbourne. Is it true that elephants are the only animals that can't jump? Uh, we've had this discussion a long time ago, I remember. I think Patrick was here even at the time. I don't know. I, I couldn't tell you. I, I've never really um, considered about the whole jumping thing. I mean, we've seen young elephants hopping. Giraffe, I don't think, can jump. I don't, can't imagine a giraffe jumping. But then again, what are we? What sort of jump are we talking about? I really, I, I don't know, Stacey. It's a difficult one because well, it's more obscure than it is difficult. I, uh, are we talking about like? I don't know. Don't know. Don't know how to even answer that. Are we talking about like jumping like a horse jumps over a pole or a hedge? Or are we talking about jumping as in standing in one place and jumping? Uh, elephant, I, wouldn't Im I would imagine if they were running, I don't imagine that they would be able to jump over something the way, say, antelope when they're running can jump over something. Um, I guess in a way the way giraffe run they could probably clear something relatively low if they had to like a tree trunk because they gallop bats can't jump Imagine a platypus can't jump. I'd like to see a hedgehog jump. Um, I'd like to see a sloth jump. Two toed or three toed. I don't care how many toes a sloth has got, I'd like to see it jump. I don't know if it's true that it's the only elephant, or rather the only animal that can't jump. I don't know. But worth thinking about, Stacey. Thank you for that. Jan in California, which is the most intelligent animal and why. Didn't get the rest of that. Oh, Jan, yes, saying thinks most of the animals are smarter than the average human. Well, in some respects, yes. I mean, in terms of survival, Every animal here, even a squirrel, is smarter than us because they will survive longer than we will. But that's because we've been domesticated for so long. Um, but I think obviously the elephant has got to come, hands down, it's got to be the smartest animal here. And why? Because elephants are not governed or not guided not ruled by instinct as much as most of the other animals almost everything about elephant is is learned it is something it is picked up it's something that they have to learn from using their trunk to learning about food to learning about where to find it and what seasons to find it in um, or rather what seasons to find things where learning their way around this is everything about an elephant. elephant's life is has to be learned so from that aspect <coughs> elephant undoubtedly the most intelligent animal
Hello Vivian, do termites have a defense mechanism like the formic acid of ants? Yes they do. Hello Impala. Small group of Impala. and listen here a little bit and watch these in color. Um, termites, defense, some of them produce a milky substance, bitter, sticky, acidic, like the snouted termite for example. The snouted termite doesn't have jaws, they have this weird snout. And they can exude a white milky liquid that discourages predators. Some termites just have very big soldiers, a case of termites that have exceptionally large heads and very, very powerful jaws that inflict quite serious bites. Like these pinnacle mound termites that we have, they have pretty big soldiers. They also have alarm calls, they have alarm mechanisms. When there's danger, they beat their heads on the termite colony walls and they well they drum basically you know it's audible you can actually hear this drumming rippling through a termite colony when you stand near a termite colony hello and father no karula today And we're going to go up towards Sandy Patch North, Sydney's Dam, Buffalo's or Cut Line, just in case. Karula is moving around again. Craig in New Zealand with Diane and Shanae as well. Hippos also can't jump. Yeah, I think so too, Craig. Evidently white men can't jump either. Ha ha, honey. Sorry, that kind of went straight through my head. I'm just like that with numbers. Taurus is giving me figures about bush babies jumping. Um, this is interesting. 
This is very interesting. A snare. An old snare. Thank God it's not around an animal. Things like this that 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 make me lose faith in mankind. Where are we going when humans can do this? Taking several pieces of wire. This is a three strands of wire. Making this kind of a loop. These ends weren't cut, so these ends were broken off from, I guess, it's just corrosion. But they would have been, that would have been like that. And that would have been the noose. That would have been set up like that. Things like this might make me, I don't want to be a human being anymore when I find things like that. I really, I just can't believe that humans do these things. Sorry, it upsets me. It's very old, it's probably been lying around and been kicked around by animals for a while. It's not dangerous in its current form. But I'm, when I get back, I'll cut it up into small pieces. But yes, someone sent in some details about bush babies jumping, and yes, they are incredible jumpers. And I've seen them clear, well, jump at least eight, eight feet. From one tree on one side of the road, they'll jump even more, eight to ten feet, in one leap. Hello, Warthog. Don't run away. Okay, well don't trot away then. Uh, Johnny. Thanks, Johnny. Warthog's gonna slow down for us. Just trotting, just maintaining its distance. Stop, well he's... He's a she.
Hi everybody, this is Tara Fan of Control and uh, we're getting an unusual break up there from the vehicle so we're just uh, cutting away and hopefully we'll be back with Mark in a very short while. Do stay with us and we should be back very soon. Now she's coming back, this warthog, following some impala. Welcome back. We just rebooted things and... She's following some impala, this warthog. Well, welcome back. Just gonna cross through to Biffles of Cut Line tracks of a lovely big elephant bull here that must have been here not too long ago actually quite fresh tracks Davina are there problems with poachers in the park not really Davina around the edges of the park yes I mean we are where we are now we're pretty close to the edge of the roof the reserve and just outside the reserve there are villages and they are known to sneak in and lay traps or send dogs in to hunt to chase animals out towards them it's subsistence poaching poaching for meat rather than the kind of ivory or rhino horn poaching guinea fowl here and they're pretty quiet.
Look at that knob thorn. It's almost in full bloom. That cream coloured knob thorn there. <coughs> That's got more flowers than any of the knob thorns I've seen in bloom. And the fever trees in Sydney's garden are also all getting new leaves. And all the green just to the left of that knob thorn. I guess maybe they get a lot more water. Strange things happening so early. Janet, hello. So I'm just hearing some alarm calls. This is where Karula disappeared yesterday. Not that there's much chance of her still being here, but just in case, she's on her way back. Janet is sending some info, interesting facts going on from the subject of elephants not being able to jump Crocodiles can't stick their tongue out and praying mantises are the only insects that can turn their heads 360 degrees Yes, one of the scarabs, one of the rhinoceros beetles, strongest animal in the world, can lift 850 times its own weight. Been baboons here. I think it's Gar again. Who can see through their eyelids? Snakes can see through their eyelids. Oh, they don't have eyelids. What was that about armadillos? Dillos, sloths, and opossums sleep or spend 80% of their life sleeping. I think lion too, you could say. 
Janet is saying she used to be married to one of those. Nice to know that it used to be. Johnny in Washington. How far do the baboons travel? I couldn't give you a figure, Johnny. Uh, it depends on how far they need to go to find food. They will have a territory. They will have an area, the home range that they live in, and they will have sleeping trees at various points within their territory. And they will spend the day foraging, and they will end up at one of their sleeping places. But I I'm, can't give you a number, I'm afraid. I have no idea how to quantify that. Maybe five kilometers, maybe two kilometers, maybe one kilometer. It's, it's they can, I guess you could say, they can move up to five kilometers in a day on, in their feeding. Call that, what, three miles, three and a half miles. Yeah, um. Depends, depends on food availability. Hello, Raisa, Raisa, sorry. <coughs> <coughs> I wish that you could be here. Too hot in, too hot in Finland. I didn't think it could get even, could it even get hot in Finland. I'll swap with you. Although, I don't know how long I'd last without elephants. But, uh, Raisa, I haven't heard any word about Mishu lately, I'm afraid. Know where he is. Um, evidently, 25th of May was the last time he was seen. Thank you, Raisa, on Arethusa's diaries. No, I haven't heard anything about uh, young Mishu, I'm afraid. But yes, I would gladly swap this temperature for the heat. I, am, I cannot do cold. I can't, I can't. It's like I just want to curl up and go to sleep and wake up when it's summer. so many layers of clothes, it's so uncomfortable. What do we wear shoes, it's so uncomfortable. It's just, I can't understand how people deal with cold. I really don't. Give me 40 degrees every day, I'll be happy.
visiting back from Sherilan. Thank you, Sherilan. Evidently, opossums are immune to snake bites, not only venomous snakes from their own habitat. That's very interesting. was that all about? I like breasted roller came in low and fast through the trees, dive bombed something in the grasses way back in Purple's Hook and then flew up again. Very strange. Tara is just letting me know to tell you that chat is back up again on the Wild Earth channel. Evidently it's been down all morning. Hey Bon, have many of the animals left Kruger? Game viewing is very spot. No, the animals don't really have anywhere to go, Yvonne. Uh, Kruger is Kruger. There's nowhere for them to go. It's temperatures that may make a big difference in game viewing. Seasons make a difference in game viewing. So it's uh, it's just a day-to-day -day thing. I mean, it is a really cold, chilly wind. This cold front came in this morning, much the same as it did yesterday. That has a huge impact on game viewing. Oh shit! Morning all. Morning. Yeah, so we can't go there though. We don't have traversing on that side of the road. So, unfortunately, you saw things that we couldn't see. <laughs> bye bye. It's lion on Buckles. Rub it in, rub it in. Hmm. No, it's just a. Weather thing, seasonal thing. Some days there's good game and some days we battle. <laughs> have to remember we only have a tiny little patch in a very big area and a lot of the animals move over much larger areas than the area that we cover and we just have to be lucky to catch them within our area. Those lion last night, two big lion, just happened to cross right through our area within, within the space of a night. And it would have been nice if they'd maybe hunted and caught something here, and they would have stuck around for a day or two. This chilly wind, and I mean chilly, it's got a bite to it. With this cold wind, nothing's going to be in the open. Everything's going to be tucked away in thicker bush. Hello, Kudu. Predicting what I just said, but yes, most things.
very young bull here, just in front of her, but they're also moving in to pick stuff. Dawn. We're not doing dry house for Wild Earth, so we well, we we are with Wild Earth Safari Dawn, so we don't have anything to do with the lodges. We don't do drives for the lodge. No, they have their own guides that they have to take the the, the guests out. So no, to answer your question, we don't do drives for the lodges. We have enough on our plates. Just Tara and myself here and other stuff that we have to do during the day. Wow, look at that Tamburti, look how red it is. Let me go back a little bit. Some of these Tambutis, this is always a pretty place for the Tambutis, but some of these Tambutis are still green, but that one is very red. That's how red they go when they start losing their leaves. before they get the new ones. Must be quite pretty down in this riverbed because there's some very big Tambuti trees down there. I don't know if that's really gonna translate well on the screen. On my little monitor I can hardly see colour. But I hope it does. Nothing really, it's just the name, Paul. Just the name of an area, an open area near camp. Um, I would love to have the name changed, but I don't have any say in the matter because it does, when we refer to it as quarantine, we constantly have to explain why it's called quarantine. It's not that I'm tired of it, it's just that it would be a lot easier if it was just given. Juma open area or the open area or just something other than because it's probably been a decade or more probably, I don't know I don't even know how long ago but a long time ago animals were brought into this area and they were kept in a quarantine enclosure on that open area and for some reason the name stuck hello Nyala well, we had Kudu now we've got their cousins the Nyala But it's just an open area near the lodge where we start off our drives often and it just happens to have a name that piques peak people's interest because it says quarantine and conjures up images of well quarantine bye bye Nyala. Hmm. Maybe we'll see a bush buck and we've seen all three of the spiral horned antelope that occur here. Saw some bush buck on quarantine the other day. Last night, no, night before. Quarantine.
Brenda, good day to you. How many species of snake on the reserve? Well, it's it's not so much on the reserve, it's here in Kruger. I don't know, Brenda, I don't know numbers. Um, I'd have to guess it. I don't know, I couldn't even guess. 50 odd? How many species of snakes? Hello, little boy, your horns are touching. Little bachelor group of impala. How many species of snake? Uh, I don't know. I'm trying to think. Karen Kruger. Got a reptile to Kruger. Maybe like 140, no, 130 something species of snake in the country. Getting ruined. <sighs> Let me see. I don't know if I'm going to get much of an answer out of this book other than how many are in the country. Okay, 130 in South Africa. 130 species in South Africa, which would, I'm guessing, Doesn't, doesn't break down into regions in this book. But I'm guessing anywhere between maybe 30 and 50 species of snakes that occur throughout Kruger and in any one given area like this here at Juma, maybe only about 20. Annie, is there a reference book I can recommend? Uh, it depends on what subject, Annie. Uh, I'm not up to date with the books of today. Most of my books date back 20 something years. I know there are a lot of new books on the market. Um, but yes, it depends on what subject I could recommend different books. The one, th the one thing that I could recommend is if you go to a website like the Fergasa website, the Field Guides Association of South Africa, if you go to their website, I'm sure, in fact I'm quite positive, they have a list of recommended reading, recommended books. Um, and those would all be the up-to-date books. I know there are a lot of books on the market that I would love to get still. Um, Either that or go to Kalahari.net. That is our local equivalent of Amazon. Kalahari.net. You could do a search under natural history or guidebooks. 
but it would be easier to get an idea of what subject you would like to look at rather than and there is one book that is a very general book that covers sort of the basics of each subject um, Tara you've got that one in NFC with you there that one of yours I'm not too sure what it's called I don't have that book but Tara's got it it's Okay, yeah, the wild, it's called The Wildlife of Southern Africa by Vincent Carruthers. Vincent Carruthers is also a f famous frog guy. He's got his own frog book. Um, hello, Hippo. And Tara says she can put the ISBN number up. But yeah, that's a, that gives you a nice background. Um, it's sort of... One book that covers the trees, the flowers, the grasses, some of the mushrooms, some of the mammals, the, some of the insects, some of the snakes, sort of the more common ones of everything. He has that female with the Roman nose. A Roman nose hippo. She's back. Three hippo we have here. A little bit of sunlight peeking through this grey really enough to even attempt to warm us up yet. I've got a question that I want to ask about computers. If there's anyone out there that knows Windows systems. I'm still unable to get to the city to take my machine in. Might still be some time before I'm able to. And last night my computer froze up and everything again as usual as it has been doing. And then it wouldn't start up again. It was just like blank. And then I tried to start it up again and it went into start up in repair mode. So it starts up in this repair mode thing. It's called start up repair. And it's been on the same thing for now. Well, it was on the same thing all night, so I tried to do it again. And it's been on the same thing now for about four and a half hours since I woke up early this morning. Startup repair. And it's got a message that says attempting repairs. Any suggestions on what I could do? I know it's difficult, people would have to see it, but just in case someone knows, I've already lost so much, I've lost most of my photos that I took between March this year and the previous two years. All my elephant shots, gone. Ooh is getting stronger. and Waterbuck. Morning children. Still no giraffe I'm afraid. I've seen some tracks but we still haven't seen a giraffe around. Someone in the parlor lying down chewing the cud. Waterbuck in the distance.
La Marietta in Budapest. Wow. I don't think we've had anyone from Budapest before. Do we ever get snow down here? No, Mary, not at this altitude, no. Higher altitudes up in places like the mountains. 6,000 feet, yes. So there are places in South Africa that do have snow up on the mountains. And occasionally, every couple of decades or so, in places like Johannesburg, we get snow. Down in the Cape on the mountains, we get snow. But no, this is, we're only a, about 300 meters above sea level here, so we don't get snow so at such a low altitude. In fact, theoretically, we shouldn't even get frost. But we, it seems to have one, got one patch of ground here that came pretty close to frost, if not a frozen night. Just a one low-lying patch. One of the bateliers is circling. Oh, let's see if we can get to chill a fan and back. get to Chilapan. Maybe we'll just go up to quarantine. Quarantine ourselves up there for the day. But we've pretty much covered the western area and yeah, well, but mostly the west from the southwest to the northwest of our range of our particular area that we cover. Which means that this afternoon we'll maybe head east and we'll look for rhino and elephant and things in the east. There have been elephants in the area that we were covering today. We obviously did miss them or were in the wrong place at the wrong time. There were some fresh tracks. We just couldn't catch up with them. Debbie, it will require some considerable thinking about, but Debbie wants to know, in all my years in the bush, have I ever come across anything that's totally surprised me, or animal behavior that has surprised me? I think often, I'm just trying to, you know, I'd have to think about that, to think about some of the most remarkable moments. Um... Nothing is really coming to mind immediately, but that's not through lack of things happening, it's probably because I'm just trying to think of something in particular. Um, gosh. difficult one just mostly because we're about to end off the drive and I'm trying to think quickly at least one thing
maybe I'll have to think about it during the day and get back to you this afternoon. <coughs> I mean, all sorts of things from mongoose trying to cross a river and getting eaten by crocodiles, snakes chasing geckos at my feet. Um, snakes visiting me in my home and coming in every day to get water from my basin to the point where I actually give them water to drink out of the inverted plug of the basin and they actually drink it to behavior of insects to elephants doing things to Finding a pangolin in the middle of the day to behavior of ants, um, nature is just full of wonders. Uh, nature stuff has been written in books, but what is written in books is only a fraction of what really happens out here in terms of behavior and things when you read a book and it'll say that elephants do this this and this and you'll find that yeah but they do a lot more than just that that's not in a book and this is quarantine and on the western edge of quarantine as you can see there's no nothing here that anything to do with quarantine any or quarantining anything but from the western edge of quarantine the sun is trying to break free trying to come out um, can you stop please <laughs> I know the cloud is lifted who knows what the weather will do today I hope it's going to improve a little bit It'll certainly be a little bit warmer this afternoon, and I'm looking forward to that. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for the questions, and I'm sorry if I couldn't give you fantastic answers this morning. Uh, it's one of those mornings, I guess. It's been fun, nonetheless. Uh, a few moments of heightened excitement, looking at leopard tracks and seeing elephant tracks, but then we didn't find them, but that's par for the course. My name is Mark, and Becky's been on camera. Tara has been in final control, and I will see you later today. Enjoy your Sunday, by the way. Everybody's going to be waking up to a Sunday. Hope you all have a wonderful day.